in the part one video i had said that fibrosis develops over week over month to years but actually we have seen in the covid 19 era that the lung fibrosis was very early and especially in the severe covid 19 so it's already mentioned in the harrison pulmonary textbook we can go and look there that if the injury stimuli is very profound and it surpass the lungs reparative mechanism in that situation fibrosis lung fibrosis or ild like picture can develop early also that we have seen in covid 19 pneumonia so this also happens so yes we know that it is an injury versus repair of the lung so it is a there is a if there is a harmony is there the lungs homeostasis is maintained but in some time if the harmony is not maintained lung injury system is persistent continuous the lung fibrosis happens because of failure of the lung reparative mechanism okay but whenever in the some scenarios some situations just we have seen in the covid 19 that when the injury stimuli are so profound and it's very enormous to start with so in that situation lung fibrosis can be there in the early phase of disease all right so it can develop even in the weeks of in the in the duration of weeks to month and usually ipa for polyfibrosis is a slow growing disease develops over a month or years all right so let's begin again part two here we have the diagnostic approach we have discussed in part one video that ild has uh, etiology known or etiology unknown in some ild we know the etiology in some we do not know the etiology so it is very important to uh, approach ild where we know the etiology known so in some some cases of ild we know the etiology it's like known etiology is just like disco d is for drugs like nitrofenidone, amiodarone, methotrexate, chemotherapy. I is for inorganic exposure, asbestos, silica, hard metals, coal dust. S is for, here we can see, smoking related ILD like DIP, RBILD and LCH. They are associated with the smoking. And C is for, here we can see, connective tissue disease related like rheumatoid arthritis, polymyositis, dermatomyositis, scleroderma, Jogglin syndrome. And O for organic exposure like birds, hay, mold or mycobacteria. So in this situation here where the etiology is known in it is DISCO. So why it's very important to know the etiology of ILD because treatment part when you come to the treatment if you know that this was the inciting event this was the etiology for ILD for that particular patient. So we can avoid exposure to this uh, factors and that will lead to improvement in this lung function. All right. Another part is where the etiology is unknown. When etiology is unknown we can have one is typical idiopathic interstitial pneumonias. It is further subdivided into IPF and non-IPF. Non-IPF is NSIP, cryptogenic organic pneumonia, lymphocyte interstitial pneumonia, and acute interstitial pneumonia, and non-specific interstitial pneumonitis. All right, and pneumonia. And it is there are some rare form of ILDs like LAM and vasculitis, and also granulomatous is sarcoidosis. The example of granulomatous ILD. So coming to the clinical history, the typical presentation of ILD is non-specific and may include a vague pulmonary complaint such as dyspnea on exertion and abnormal radiograph and cough. So the patient will have dyspnea on exertion. We have studied, we have discussed in part one that it is a patient becomes more dyspneic when they are doing some work, all right? Because that their diffusion limitation and ventilation perfusion mismatch that increases and that becomes more that reflected more when the ventilatory demand is high in case of exercise or the patient is walking or patient is doing some exercise in that situation ventilatory demand is high but because of the stiff membrane a stiff interstitium there is a diffusion limitation and ventilation perfusion mismatch and ultimately leading to hypoxia and sense of dyspnea and cough cough will be typical dry cough why there will be dry cough because we know it is a in, involved in the interstitium and interstitium there are cough receptors are there j receptors are there they are stimulated and causing the cough so and productive cough arise from the we know that it arises from the airway to the alveoli so typical ild will have a dry cough it will not have a expectoration so by the nature of cough we can also differentiate between the disease site if it is airway or alveolar diseases it usually have a productive cough just like pneumonia bronchitis but if it is interstitial disease just like in pulmonary edema in, uh, in ild also it will have a dry cough mainly all right and have an abnormal chest radiograph in some cases, the time course of disease may suggest certain forms of ILD. That some diseases are acute presentation, some subacute, and some chronic ILDs are presented. So, time course will also have some idea. The acute forms of ILD must be distinguished from the respiratory infection and pulmonary edema due to congestive heart failure. Some acute ILDs they represent 
their clinical presentation is just like congestive heart failure. One clue for the ILD presenting as a CHF is that if that shortness of breath or that shadow on X-ray, even after giving diuretic, it not resolved, and if the dyspnea is persisting despite proper diuresis, proper uh, uh, fluid balance, and making the patient negative, making try to patient making the patient dry using Lasix or Ditor, shadows are persisting and dyspnea is persisting. So we should always think of underlying ILD in that patient. So, what is the time course of disease onset? Acute is cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, acute hypersensitive pneumonitis, diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, acute interstitial pneumonia, acute exacerbation of ILD. This is very important. Acute exacerbation of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or other ILD. That is called AE ILD. A patient with interstitial lung disease, non diagnosed patient having acute exacerbation and acute worsening of his symptoms. So, that is called acute exacerbation of ILD. What are the subacute to chronic presentation? It could be connective tissue disease associated ILD, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, sarcoidosis, chronic, hypers chronic hypersensitive pneumonitis, occupational lung disease, NSIP, DIP, respiratory bronchiolitis, ILD, lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia, chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. They all have subacute to chronic presentation. Some non-specific symptoms, some systemic symptoms are there, which is very maybe non-specific sometimes, like night sweats, fever, fatigue, or weight loss. Heliotrope rash, Gorton papule, mechanic hand in case of dermatomyositis associated with ILD, is a history of skin tightness, thickening, tailing ectasia, Reynolds phenomena, digital pitting in systemic sclerosis because this uh, connective tissue disease associated with the ILD, especially this is seen in connective tissue associated interstitial lung disease. Papular eruptions, lupus pernio and erythema nodosum may also be seen in sarcoidosis. Patient with SLE, Medisca, malar rash, photosensitivity, skin rash, and halodose. Why lungs are involved in connective tissue disease? Because connective tissue disease by the name itself implies it is a disease of connective tissue system. And we know pulmonary interstitium is also a connective tissue of the lung and it is a skeleton. All right. So connective tissue disease as just like your systemic sclerosis, the connective tissue is involved. So the same way that interstitium is made of connective tissue and that will be also involved. So, connective tissue patient, the patient having connective tissue disease, they have a very high risk of developing interstitial lung disease and this is a known cause of ILD. Occupational history is very important to know, it should be very thorough history we have, you should take in our pulmonary medicine including review of all jobs done in the past and occup any occupation with, with a significant history of exposure to organic or inorganic product was present because we know that in some uh, known and it, uh, unknown etiologies are there which are causing ILD. Here is some example like occupation is electrician, plumber, pipe fitter, construction worker, ship builders, insulation installers. They have exposure of asbestos and causing asbestosis. If somebody is working stone cutter, miner, sand blaster, they are exposed to crystalline dust or silica that is causing silicosis. Metal grinder. They are exposed to hard metal like cobalt, tungsten, carbide and leading to giant cell interstitial pneumonia or hard metal lung disease sometimes. Metal worker, factory worker, they are exposed to beryllium and causing berylliosis. Coal worker, we all know they are exposed to coal dust causing coal worker pneumoconiosis. Paint worker, spray worker, plastic worker, they are exposed to isocyanate causing chemical worker in the lungs and bird breeder, breeders, they are exposed to bird droppings, organic substance causing ex exposure leading to the bird breeders lung. Environmental history is very important. Organic exposure also frequently encountered just we have uh, seen in the etiology part in household and office setting also like humidification system in the sometimes contaminated with the mold that can cause ILD. Hot tub and other aerosolized water source have led to lung disease led to the growth of microbiome AVM like it is also called hot, hot tub lung. Cigarette smoke is one of the most common environmental exposure and is strongly linked to the three forms of ILD that is DIP, RBILD and LCH. And cigarette smoking, we know, identified as a risk factor for IPF also. So, what will the effective treatment here? If the patient is a smoker and after evaluating, we know that the patient is having ILD, we, we are able to figure out that patient is having DIP or RBILD on the basis of CT findings and the patient is a smoker. So, the most effective intervention, the most advice we can say the patient that you stop smoking and this patient, when they stop smoking, lung function improves, CT findings also improves in time all right so this is important of history taking in ild to know the inciting event so detailed history should be taken in any patient
presented to us with interstitial lung disease. Medication is very important. We know that we have seen that medications, there are certain medications they are uh, known to cause ILD. Just like some common drugs are antimicrobials like cephalosporin, nitrofurantoin, it is the most common of the most common drug used, especially in the older female uh, patient, uh, population because of recurrent UTI. So, it is given for 3 months, 6 months sometimes. So, it is also implicated to causing ILD, penicillin, sulfonamide, anti inflammatory agents, aspirin, gold, methotrexate. NSAID, penicillamine, these are the usually anti rheumatoid drugs. They are used in the patient with the rheumatic disorders and have a ex chronic exposure to month to years. So, they have they can cause ILD. We should always keep in our mind. And cardiovascular drugs, we know amiodarone is a known for its causing pulmonary fibrosis, even ACE inhibitors and beta blockers, hydrogen, hydrochlorothiazide are also implicated to cause pulmonary fibrosis and ILD in due course of time. Family history is very important. Because some ILD have a genetic component like Hermansky Podolak syndrome, Bert Hug Dubey syndrome, and neurofibromosis type 2. So, they have a they run in the family. Coming to the physical exam, what we can get in the general survey? Clubbing. It's a very important sign in the clubbing. Clubbing is a very important sign we see in the nail bed and cyanosis in case of acute exacerbation of ILD, mechanics hand that signifies your uh, connective tissue dis dis disorders and some skin tightness that will you can see here just by pulling the this one the skin and looking at the skin for the scleroderma. On systemic examination, we can have fine inspiratory bibacillar velcro crepitations that we uh, see typically in case of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Wheezing we can get, we can also have a sign of pulmonary hypertension or right heart failure in the form of loud P2 component, right ventricular heave and elevated jugular venous pressure and lower extremity edema. This usually develops over time in the patient who are having, having a, uh, they are having a history of ILD for a pretty long long years or long time. So, they, they develop sign of pulmonary hypertension and we, these are the findings of pulmonary hypertension. On chest imaging, we can have uh, upper low predominance, lower low predominance, mid low predominance. Some ILDs have a specific area, for example, sarcoidosis, silicosis, LCH are among the diseases with the upper low predominance. While IPF, connective tissue disease or ILD and asbestosis are all lower low predominant. We should always uh, remember this thing. Peripheral alveolar opacities are typical of organizing pneumonia and chronic eosinophilic pneumonia. They are located peripherally. Lower lung volumes are apparently shrunken. In ILD, lungs look smaller size and shrunken. HRCT is a typical finding. Nowadays, uh, ILDs are diagnosed based on the typical CT findings also. And it has been updated recently. So, we can have a look that also to have a updated uh, findings. So, the typical IPF features on CT is classically known as UIP, usual interstitial pneumonia pattern. What does it mean? Definite UIP have this following five features like it will be peripheral, have a subpleural distribution, bibacillar predominance will be there, reticular markings and tractional bronchiectasis bronchiatis will be there, honeycombing. Honeycombing is a typical feature of definite UIP and absence of inconsistent finding like uh, ground gas opacities, consolidations, reticulations. So, these are the inconsistent features. What are the atypical for a definite UIP? Atypical is upper or mid lung predominance, peribronchovascular distribution, ground glass opacities that is out of proportion of reticulation, profuse micronodules, multiple bilateral discrete cystic, cystic areas, diffuse bilateral mosaic attenuation, air trapping and consolidation. So, this is a atypical. It means this is not a definite UIP. Definite UIP, if any CT finding having a definite UIP, this should be, this finding should be there. Here we can see a 82 year old man with uh, progressive dyspnea and having UIP pattern. HRCT shows at the mid thorax and the lower level. Here we can see reticular markings and architectural distortion. We can see honeycombing in the and bibacillar area. So, the patient has no exposure and no clinical evidence of connective tissue disease. The final diagnosis was idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Here, no biopsy was performed, and the diagnosis was made based on CT criteria only. Here, we can see this is the area of this is the area of reticulation. This is the area of architectural distortion, a small subpolar cyst, and honeycombing. If we enlarge it, we can see it clearly. Here, this is the area of. Here, we can see. Okay. Here we can see these are the area of reticulations. This is area of reticulation. These are the subpleural area of cystic spaces. Here we can see, and these are typical like 
this this is honeycombing typical honeycombing here you can see all right so this is typical of ipf this is another 58 year old woman in organized pneumonia secondary to breast cancer radiation therapy here we can see in on the, if you see in the uh, city film b here you can see the ground glass opacity with frank area of consolidation she has this this responds very well organized pneumonia responds very well to corticosteroid therapy here we can see in ct this looks like a typical here we consolidation with the air bronchogram and this is the area of mosaic attenuation and ground glass opacities so this is the area of ground glass opacification air bronchogram sign here we can see in the area of consolidation so this patient responded very well to corticosteroid lab testing is required especially especially in the patient who have been connected to tissue disease just to figure out the cause of the ild like in scleroderma zogren syndrome polymyositis and different markers are there so they they are found in the typical connective tissue disease okay they are the markers of connective tissue disease during pft we have a typical st pattern we all know and there will be decrement in the dlco form of 6 mmol test is also useful in the functional assessment and exercise, exercise capacity uh, it should be done regularly when the patient is coming to the opd a known patient of ild copd and any chronic lung condition 6 mmol test is very useful to assess the functional assessment and the exercise capacity and limitation of the patient all right other diagnostic test we can do here in the bronchoscopy a balfour but that is rarely required that is very not very used very commonly surgical lung biopsy is almost not done nowadays based because ct findings are very well in the ild and very well appreciated sometimes what is the treatment of ild there are the various options available for the ild treatment number one first foremost comes your removal from the exposure by the taking detailed history we should know the which factor what are the etiology of ild ild to preserve the lung function we should always always do our effort to find out the etiology of the ild if at all we have any reason if we find any etiology for ild we should remove that exposure and ultimately lung function is stabilized and in the due course of time lung function also improves and some situation we use immunosuppressive therapy like corticosteroids antifibrotic now perfenidone entertain we use sometimes supportive therapy is all required immunosuppression drugs pulmonary rehabilitation program and spirometry and these are the arm stretching exercises they are all required for the to improve their exercise capacity and six minute walk test we should also treat for the comorbidity illness because we know that gastroesophageal reflux disease if the patient is having reflux micro respiration cause more further lung damage in the patient with ild palliative care lung transplantation are the limited options for the patient having a well advanced and severe ild so to conclude the approach of ild includes a careful history and physical exam with a focus to identify etiology of ild i am stressing this point every time that we should try to figure out the etiology of ild that what is causing the lung fibrosis or ild in that situation if you know the etiology we can remove the patient we can remove the exposure and ild lung function improves important consideration include a, a complete investigation of the environmental occupational drug exposure as well as thorough search for the underlying connective tissue disease okay means if the connective tissue disease is there if, if there is ctd associated associated ild if we take care of connective tissue disease treatment properly ild will improve itself lab test pulmonary physiological studies radiography and biopsy of lung tissue may be necessary sometime and multidisciplinary review and is essential part of the diagnostic evaluation decision is regard regards the diagnostic and therapeutic approach must be individualized for a particular a patient to patient and case to case basis so thank you hope this video and this dis discussion helped a little bit understanding of the ild and approach to ild so share like and subscribe the channel for more simplified video on the topic okay thank you See you in the next video. Thank you.